Mark Wahlberg transitioned from a cheesy rap career to modeling drawls to becoming a actor and producer. He's been nominated for several Academy Awards, Golden Globes, and Primetime Emmys. He's well respected in the industry and receives support from fellow actors, producers, and directors, despite having a hot, stinking mess reputation and a very questionable past. Today, we won't be talking about every single movie and TV show he has appeared in. We simply don't have the time, and that's not the purpose of this video. Instead, we'll be diving deep into Mark's history of being a walking, talking red flag. But before we get into it, don't forget to scoop up something to munch on at rrgsnacks.com, our online concession stand that has an assortment of barbecue beef jerky, buffalo ranch popcorn, and butter toffee peanuts. Mark Wahlberg was born in Boston on June 5, 1971. So yes, that makes him a Gemini. And no, his zodiac sign doesn't matter. We just like to add this information to some of our videos for our RRG besties that are into that sort of thing. According to the LA Times, he struggled to find his voice as the ninth and last child of Alma and Edmund Wahlberg. He told the newspaper that by the time he arrived in the world, his parents were too exhausted to spoil him. However, he did admit that he was able to, quote, get away with murder. His parents got divorced when he was 11, and his mom blames the split on Mark's delinquent behavior. She told the New York Times she was too busy working and feeling sorry for herself to notice that her son was terrorizing folks out in them streets. She said, emotionally, I just wasn't available to him. Mark dropped out of school at the age of 14 and settled into his new routine. He would wake up, go out, hustle, make money, steal, sell substances, do substances, and rob people. He also mentioned he was preyed upon a lot, and he had to learn to protect and defend himself since, as a teenager, he was only 5 feet 2 inches tall and 120 pounds. In an effort to keep him off the streets, his brother Donnie convinced him to join his new group called New Kids on the Block. Ignoring the fact that Mark couldn't sing or play an instrument, Donnie knew Mark would be a good fit thanks to his dance moves. However, Mark quit the group after only a few months, deeming the music too bubblegum. In 1986, a group of fourth graders was on a field trip at a beach in Dorchester, a mixed but segregated Boston neighborhood that had seen racial tensions during the years the city was under court-ordered school integration. While the children were leaving the beach, they encountered 15-year-old Mark and a few of his friends. Mark claimed he was intoxicated at the time. One of the victims told the Associated Press many years later that Mark and his partners in crime chased them down the street throwing rocks and yelling racial epithets at them, including kill the N-words, until an ambulance driver intervened. She said, I was really scared. My heart was beating fast. I couldn't believe it was happening. The names, the rocks, the kids chasing. Instead of getting locked up for committing a hate crime, a Boston judge issued a civil rights injunction against Mark and his friends. Or, in other words, he and his friends were essentially given a stern warning that if they committed another hate crime, they would be sent to jail. Did Mark learn from that situation and turn his life around? Not quite. Two years later, 16-year-old Mark and his friends smoked substances belonging to his friend's mom, not knowing it was laced with PCP. In an interview with the LA Times, Mark blamed the substances for making him and his friends go ballistic. According to court documents, Mark and his friends hit the streets and confronted a Vietnamese immigrant as he got out of his car with two cases of beer. Mark called the victim a racial slur and beat him over the head with a five-foot wooden stick until the victim lost consciousness and the rod broke in two. Court documents then state Mark ran up to another Vietnamese man and asked if he could help him hide. After a police cruiser drove past, Mark punched the second victim in the eye and made a racist remark about the shape of the victim's eyes. Mark was caught and received a felony conviction of assault and battery, possession of MJ, and criminal contempt for violating his prior civil rights injunction. Mark claimed he was intoxicated at the time and that the attacks weren't race-related. 
he served 45 days of a two-year prison sentence. Upon his release, he convinced Donnie to help him get together an act of his own called Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. It was the perfect time for him to embark on a rap career. Thanks to the multi-platinum commercial success of Vanilla Ice, record labels were interested in adding white rappers just like Mark to their roster. Now, ain't it strange that Mark gravitated toward a genre of music that was created by a group of people that he didn't even like? You know what? Never mind. His debut album, Music for the People, was released in 1991. The album spawned two hit singles, Good Vibrations and Wild Side, and was certified platinum. Mark didn't become a true mainstream phenomenon until after a performance at a Southern California amusement park. He dropped his pants right there on stage, and from there, he turned his shows into amateur strip teases. He also took his act to gay clubs. While he soaked up the attention from the LGBTQ community, he wasn't entirely an ally. During a December 1992 interview with The Word, the host asked Jamaican dance hall artist Shaba Ranks how he felt about fellow musician Buju Banton, who was getting criticized for his lyrics promoting violence toward gays and lesbians. Shaba replied that gays deserved to be crucified. Instead of denouncing the comments, Mark later joined Shaba on stage for a song and applauded Shaba for speaking his mind. While Shaba went on to be blackballed by several companies due to his remarks, Mark kept on chugging along without any apparent repercussions. Well, for a while at least. Entertainment mogul David Geffen caught wind of Mark's electrifying stage shows and spread the word to his friend designer Calvin Klein, who signed Mark to a lucrative modeling contract. In the early 90s, Mark and his tidy whities were plastered across billboards in every major city and magazines, alongside supermodel Kate Moss. Years later, Kate told Vanity Fair she had a nervous breakdown before the photo shoot. She was only 17 at the time of the shoot and was asked to appear topless. In one image, Kate can be seen straddling 21-year-old Mark. The ad campaign was released along with this super cringy commercial. Shouts goes out to my man Calvin Klein, good looking out for the drawers. Oh, she got freckles. <laughs> Next question. No, the best protection against AIDS is to keep your Calvins on. Gay rights activists headed out to Times Square to protest Mark's involvement with the campaign. But that wasn't the only thing Mark had to deal with. The Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence dug up Mark's past convictions and crimes against black people and Asians and brought the news to mainstream media. Calvin Klein finally issued a statement condemning homophobia and racism and called Mark a reformed young man who had grown way beyond his years. As for Mark, he knew he couldn't wiggle his way out of the controversy. Knowing that a reputation for homophobia and racism could spell the end of his career, he issued an apology. His statement read, Asian Pacific Americans, African Americans, and all people have the right to live free of violence and harassment. I want to make it clear that I condemn anti-gay hatred and violence. He also announced he would work with both groups to help, quote, spread the word that bigotry and violence are wrong. As a part of a deal worked out between him and anti-bias groups, Mark agreed to film public service announcements condemning racial and homophobic violence. Away from all of the drama, Mark didn't have a care in the world. He was enjoying the money that was pouring in from his music and modeling career. He told Rolling Stone he spent all his cash as quickly as he made it. He splurged on clothes, a boat, private jets, and four and a half pound lobsters. And it wasn't uncommon for him to leave $500 tips wherever he went. He told the magazine, Man, my credit card bills ran from $70,000 to $150,000 a month. Mark couldn't let go of his wild side. He dedicated his autobiographical 1992 picture book to his baloney pony. In August 1992, Mark was accused of getting into a brutal fight with a man named Robert Crean. In an odd twist, the altercation started after the victim called Mark's black bodyguard a racial slur, and Mark sprung into action by kicking the man in the face while his bodyguard held the man down. Mark avoided criminal charges by settling a civil lawsuit with the victim, and the bodyguard's charges were dismissed as a part of the deal. Mark's second album, You Gotta Believe, was a flop. By 1993, he was a washed-up musician and underwear model with a bad reputation. But then, Penny Marshall and Danny DeVito, who had seen his Calvin Klein posters, said they wanted to chat with him about a movie they were putting together called Renaissance Man. Mark was supposed to study the script, but he didn't. The three of them talked for about an hour, and Mark explained how he had been lying his way through life. 
and they told him that acting was pretty much the same thing. So he decided he would give it a shot and audition for the role of Private Tommy Lee Haywood. He said, you know, I'd always gotten over the judges and the lawyers and my mother, so I figured I could do it. While waiting to hear back about his audition, he was at a party in July 1993 when a fight broke out between him and members of Madonna's entourage. There are conflicting reports about what started the brawl. People magazine stated tempers flared when Mark used a gay slur toward a member of Madonna's group. Mark stated one of Madonna's bodyguards blindsided him with a punch. He responded by knocking the man upside the head with a soda bottle. Mark later admitted in an interview that he broke the guy's nose. Madonna called the cops, but no arrests were made. Word got back to Penny about the fight. Although she was apprehensive, she still decided to take a chance on Mark and give him the role in Renaissance Man. Mark said that after that experience, he became more focused on acting. He tried to be a better person off the set as well, but the streets were calling. He told The Guardian that he never skipped a night of saying his prayers. Even if he was about to get it in with his then-girlfriend, he would pray beforehand and ask God to forgive him ahead of time for the fornication that was about to take place. Although he and his then-girlfriend were together for a while, he admitted he wasn't comfortable being in a relationship. He added, I have a hard time staying faithful. In 1997, Boogie Nights made Mark hugely famous, though he has said since that he has some regrets about appearing in the film since it doesn't fit in with Catholicism. In 2001, he started dating Victoria's Secret model Rhea Durham. They had at least one confirmed breakup before they announced the birth of their first child in September 2003. On the same day their daughter was born, Mark's sister Debbie had a heart attack and tragically passed away at the age of 43. Days later, after witnessing Rhea go through 10 hours of labor, he proposed and she said yes. But was he really trying to settle down? Nope. Months later, juicy gossip websites reported Mark was caught getting close to Jessica Alba at a party. He and Rhea reportedly called off their engagement, only to reconcile shortly thereafter. In 2004, Mark served as executive producer of Entourage, and he and Rhea welcomed their second child in 2006. Their third child arrived in 2008, and by that point, Mark was ready to seal the deal. In August 2009, after eight years of dating, they got married with their three children in attendance. Oh, and Rhea had another baby in the oven at the time of the ceremony. They welcomed child number four in January 2010. As he settled into family life, articles about his past would pop up every few years. Nonetheless, he was honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2010. Then came 2012. Unsatisfied with a vaguely written scene for the film Broken City, where Mark's character calmly walks away after a fight with his girlfriend, Mark decided to improvise. Or some say he returned to his roots. The film's director told MTV.com that Mark went to a bodega, bought two 40-ounce bottles of malt liquor, and got hammered before he tossed the bottle at an SUV, causing approximately $10,000 worth of damage. Then he tore the security gates off an NYC storefront. Mark didn't stop there, though. He initiated a street fight with strangers. The director added, All of it was very real. None of it was staged. He was doing his Tupac. He was King Kong in it. After doing the most, the film opened to scathing reviews and went straight to DVD a few months later. On the bright side, he finally obtained his GED that same year. In 2014, while people protested in Ferguson and other cities in support of Mike Brown and black Americans who are targeted and mistreated by the cops, Mark filed documents to receive a pardon for his past crimes. I've been working for 27 years to right the wrongs that I've done and the mistakes that I've made as a child. And, you know, those are things that affected me deeply. Now being a parent, being a role model, and trying to inspire inner city kids that anything is possible and there isn't anything that they can't overcome. However, the public was skeptical of his motives. The Hollywood Reporter noted that his request was most likely associated with his new venture in the fast food business, a chain of burger joints called Wall Burgers. And then, after digging deeper into his pardon application, it was revealed that Mark wrote that his prior record might be the basis to deny him a concessionaire's license in the state of California and elsewhere, which is an apparent reference to a planned expansion of his Wahlburgers franchise. 
One of his victims, the Boston fourth grader that was on a field trip at the beach when she and her classmates were accosted by Mark and his friends, told the Associated Press that Mark didn't deserve a pardon. At the time of the interview, the victim was 38, and she said the attack caused trauma that will never fade. She added, If you're a racist, you're always going to be a racist. It was a hate crime, and that's exactly what should be on his record forever. However, his other victim, one of the Vietnamese men from the 1988 attack, told the Daily Mail, He was young and reckless, and I forgive him now. Everyone deserves another chance. I would like to see him get a pardon. He should not have the crime hanging over him any longer. In September 2016, two years after applying for the pardon, Mark's request was dropped after he failed to answer a letter asking if he wanted to keep it open. Now, let's fast forward to June 2020. The internet ripped Mark a new one when he condemned the murder of George Floyd in an Instagram post. He ended his statement using the hashtag Black Lives Matter. One social media user responded, Weren't you the one who beat up black kids? Whether he's delivering meals to nurses during the COVID pandemic or donating shoes to children in Palm Beach County, some people will never let him forget his past. If his peers in Hollywood don't care about his reputation, that's fine. But keep in mind, it's the consumer who gets to decide which celebrities they support and put money in their pockets and which ones they choose to hold accountable for their actions. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to let us know down below. And thanks for watching RRG.